Shall we get started? Yeah, sure. Okay, good afternoon. Today we have the very fortunate to have a distinguished speaker, Professor Xiaogang Wang from MIT. Professor Wang received a PhD degree in physics from the University of Science and Technology in China in 1982 and PhD in physics from Princeton in 87. He studied the super, super string series under theoretical physicist Ed Witten at Princeton. Then switched his field to condensed matter physics while working with theoretical physicist Bob Schaefer, Frank Welter, and the Tony Zane in the Institute of Theoretical Physics at Santa Barbara. He joined faculty in 1991 at MIT. Now he is the Cecilia and Ada Green Professor of Physics at MIT. He is also a distinguished Moore scholar at Caltech. He currently is back for Caltech, that's why we are taking advantage of his presence in the sunny California. <laughs> and a distinguished research chair at the Columbia Institute. And numerous honors, I wouldn't be able to list all of them in the time allotted, so I'll just talk about two. One is the APS Oliver Barclay Prize for theoretical for series of topological order and its consequence in a broad range of physical systems. I guess today's topic is related to that. And he was also elected as a member of the National Academy in 2018 in recognition of distinguished continuing continuing achievement in original research. So yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to visit uh, Stanford. And uh, my first visit to Stanford happened many many years ago, maybe thirty some years ago. At that time, it just switched from super string theory to condensed matter. So it's a good chance for me uh, to talk to my new colleague in condensed matter physics in Stanford. So it's a very important event for me. So I'm very happy uh, to come back. And today I'm going to talk about this, uh, 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 this new understanding of symmetry and there, uh, there may be uh, some new way to understand the, the, the gapless uh, quantum uh, system. You know, the so-called quantum matter actually corresponds to the, the state matter at a zero temperature. Okay, so we have uh, three kinds of uh, quantum matter uh, broadly. So the first one is, uh, we can call this uh, the one with energy gap. That is, uh, we have a few ground states, maybe degenerate, but then there's a finite energy gap. Then maybe you have a continuum above this energy gap. So this, uh, this, this kind of a gapped quantum matter is kind of simple because at the low energy, there's nothing, just a degenerate ground state. So it's kind of uh, almost trivial. And the bandwidth insulator and the uh, fractional quantum Hall state are example of those kind of uh, quantum matter. And the next class I uh, call the simple, they are gapless. So there's not too many low energy, low energy excitation. And uh, so like a Dirac semi-metal or wild semi-metal or superfluid, the, the critical point of continuous transition, they belong to this kind of a simple gapless uh, quantum matter. The third one, also gapless, but kind of messy. It's like a, a Fermi liquid with a Fermi surface. Then there's a lot of a low energy excitation. And uh, uh, so we, we say kind of uh, uh, messy. And uh, also, that also, also means that uh, the low energy effective theory of describing this Fermi surface actually can be very strange. I almost want to say that uh, that is beyond the quantum field theory. In a sense, uh, if you really, really want to use quantum field theory to describe a Fermi liquid, you may need a, a field theory with infinite number of fields. And so something really is strange. So we call, we call that a messy. And uh, certainly these uh, three classes of quantum matter can also be divided into two parts. One is uh, weakly correlated or weakly interacting. Another is uh, strongly correlated or strongly uh, interacting. And actually, we have a pretty good systematic understanding of weakly correlated quantum matter. For example, uh, for gap the quantum matter, uh, gap the states, we have this uh, band theory. Uh, we can add some kind of uh, topological twist to band theory. 
Then we get uh, the K theory for topological insulator or topological superconductor. So those are weakly correlated gap states. Then for weakly correlated simple gap states, certainly we have a Dirac, uh, a Dirac semi-metal, a wire semi-metal, and a superfluid, uh, those kind of things are kind of uh, uh, weakly correlated uh, gapless -like states, uh, simple gapless -like states. And uh, those, uh, those, uh, th this kind of gapless -like state is well described by quantum field theory. So quantum field theory is very good for those kind of things. And we also have this uh, weakly correlated messy gapless -like states, <laughs> like uh, the Fermi liquid theory, with a quasi particle near Fermi surface. And uh, as I mentioned, this may be beyond the quantum field theory. And uh, then the, the really interesting thing is that uh, we also have a strongly correlated quantum matter, and those are much uh, difficult to understand. It's a, uh, uh, really the uh, challenge for theoretical physics. And for strongly correlated gap uh, states, and we have a systematic theory. Uh, the systematic theory based, uh, based on Ginsberg-Landau theory and based on symmetry breaking and the mathematical framework uh, for this is a group theory. And uh, so basically, that uh, this, uh, at the low energy, uh, maybe the, the ground state have less symmetry than the system of Hamiltonian, so we have simultaneous symmetry breaking. And the key point is that uh, the different gap of the phase are really different because they have different symmetry. So, so the symmetry breaking pattern really characterizes a different gap of the phase. So this is the main, uh, main message. However, uh, uh, actually that's not the end of story. Actually, when I switched from string theory to condensed matter physics, and uh, someone told me you, 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 it's a bad move because condensed matter physics are finished, and uh, all, the, all, the, all the different phase of matter are classed by symmetry, different other parameter. Then, the, then whenever you see a phase transition, you just identify the symmetry, then using Gimbal theory, then you get everything. So there's uh, not too much uh, theoretical uh, uh, mystery here. But actually, fortunately, uh, we have this uh, quantum hostess, <laughs> which is actually something beyond the symmetry breaking. And uh, so, uh, so this uh, group theory uh, don't really uh, uh, describe them well. And uh, it turns out that uh, these, uh, these, uh, these kind of uh, quantum house states uh, really strongly correlated. Uh, it's an example of a strongly correlated gap uh, matter. And uh, the, the, they are characterized by that uh, they have fractionalization. When you add the electron to quantum house state, electron may decay into three quasi particles with a charge one third each and have a fractional statistics. So those kind of uh, very mysterious, very uh, striking property actually kind of happens. Okay, so, uh, so over these uh, uh, so many years, uh, we start to get a systematic uh, understanding of this kind of a gap uh, uh, quantum matter. And uh, it turns out that uh, uh, this kind of gap matter are characterized by the long range uh, uh, many about the entanglement. So it's not like an other parameter, not symmetry breaking pattern, but some pattern of a many about the entanglement. Then you may ask, uh, what is the mathematical foundation to describe a many about the entanglement? Certainly it's not group theory. Then it's what? Then it turns out something really weird theory, like uh, this, uh, 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 this, this, uh, this, uh, 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 some, some kind of a higher category theory, you know, some very abstract theory, uh, which replaces group theory, actually describe a many body entanglement. And uh, to the degree that uh, at the moment we probably are, we can make a list of all possible many body entanglement. So basically make a list of a topological order and uh, try to see uh, what, what, what possible phase are there. It's just like uh, using group theory, we can classify all different possible symmetry breaking pattern. And using category theory, we can really describe all possible entanglement pattern. It's kind of similar thing like that. Then we have this uh, strongly correlated simple gapless state, and which uh, the typical example is uh, like a like a like a different symmetry breaking pattern. So so one gapless state is a one symmetry breaking pattern. Then we have another gapless state of different symmetry breaking pattern. 
then between symmetry, two symmetry breaking patterns, we may have a continuous transition, and which is a gapless. And these are, are really give us this, uh, uh, this uh, simple gapless uh, state matter. But, uh, but when it's strongly correlated, we, can, we have something uh, more challenging, is that uh, this gapless state matter may not have a well-defined quasi particle. So if using field theory to describe it, you don't know which field to choose because there's no well-defined quasi particle. And in one plus one dimension, uh, we have conformal field theory. So even without well-defined quasi particle, you can still have a systematic theory to describe those gapless uh, uh, critical point. But however, for the higher dimension, we have a trouble. We we don't have a very systematic theory to describing all this critical point. Yeah. Yeah, I mean for the one plus one, at least much of this, they do have quasi particles. They have bosonized quasi particles, but they're, they're that's true. Quasi particles. Yes, uh, you are totally right. Uh, in some case, yeah, we do have a well-defined quasi particle. But however, for example, for the icing transition, for the icing transition, uh, uh, the well-defined quasi particle happen to be the fermion. This is a Marana fermion. Yeah. You can use a Marana fermion to describe isencritic point. Right. Then for some other uh, critical point, indeed you have the bosonized uh, uh, boson is well defined quasi particle describe that. So some critical point indeed have well defined quasi particle, but there's many other symmetry breaking transition which don't have a well defined quasi particle. So so majority I try to say majority of them don't have a quasi particle, but some of them have a quasi particle in those theory. We have very simple field theory to describe them. But then for, for other which don't have a defined quasi particle, then we have to scratch our head to see what, what should you do. So, uh, so here I'm emphasizing on other spec. Then for those uh, without quasi particle, do we have a general understanding of them? And uh, so, uh, so that's raise a, a, raise a, 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 a kind of a theoretical challenge. That then we also have these strongly correlated messy gap states. And in this case, we don't have a general theory. And but uh, if you don't have a general theory, you may say, oh, these things don't exist. <laughs> but uh, actually, uh, in the high t super connector, there's a pseudo gap phase. Suggest that maybe such things do exist. And this is captured, uh, it's characterized by the Fermi arc. You know, usually the, for, the, for the Fermi liquid theory, we got a region which are filled by electron, other region is unfilled in the brain zone. Then the boundary between these two regions is a Fermi surface, which always, always form a loop or close the surface. And uh, so Fermi surface should be always uh, closed with no boundary. But uh, experiments really say that, uh, yeah, we could have Fermi surface, which is just like arc, then end somewhere. Then it's very hard to say, uh, this region is a field, that region is empty, then the boundary between two regions is, uh, is Fermi surface, but, but with arc, it's really uh, don't know. Yeah, this kind of thing may ha happen in a, in a so-called uh, underdoped super, uh, high-t superconductor, it's called a pseudo gap phase, and uh, yeah, at the moment we don't have a, a good theory uh, for that. So, so this is, a, a, to me, I would say this is maybe the, uh, one of the most important questions in the high superconductor. Because uh, when I first uh, entered into this, uh, 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 this field of high superconductor, uh, people say that uh, the most important thing is to find a mechanism. But when you say that, it's, uh, people already assume that uh, the normal state of Fermi liquid. You want to find a mechanism where Fermi liquid became unstable and became a superconductor. Uh, but uh, after 30 years of working in high superconductor, Maybe this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this assumption may be, be, be questionable. That uh, uh, the, the superconducting state is pretty normal. It's maybe it's a D wave. Well, that's not, 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 not that normal, but it's, it's a, theoretically we have a theory. But the normal state is even more strange, more abnormal. We don't even have a theory for normal state for unadopted superconductor. And so the way, when we see the mechanism, we don't know this instability of what, you know. Uh, so, so that's a wonderful uh, mystery. So today I will try to I won't I won't discuss this messy gap states. So I will I will try to have an understanding of a, hopefully have a systematic understanding of a simple gap states. So basically try to understand this uh, uh, this critical point 
uh, and even when this critical point don't have any quasi particle, can we have a systematic understanding? And also, it's kind of uh, in the direction, can we have very general understanding so that we can classify all those uh, gapless states? Just like uh, we can classify all the gapless states, either using group theory or using category theory. But for gapless states, can we have a very general understanding of all of them? So that is uh, the thing we, we, we are thinking we try to do. And uh, so, so how to develop a general theory uh, for, for, for gapless states? So, so the situation now is kind of similar to the situation we encounter in the early days of quantum Hall states. You know, uh, well, I will still remember when I heard about the quantum power state, people say it's a spin liquid. Oh, sorry, it's, a, it's, a, it's quantum liquid, not spin. It's a quantum liquid. Quantum liquid means uh, it's a mess. You know, there's no internal structure. Everything's random, so it's a quantum liquid. Uh, but after, you know, 30 years, then we, now when, when I say quantum power state, then the picture in my mind is more like a crystal. There's a lot of internal structure. But the, now when we say the gaply state with no quasi particle, they also kind of mess. We don't know how to really uh, capture it. And uh, so the, uh, but the, but the, the first step is that to find some label for those uh, gaply states. But not a label like phase A, phase B, but some more educated label. So what is educated label? So one possible label is uh, this uh, emerging symmetry. So gapless state have the character that it, it, it may have a more symmetry at the low energy than the original lattice Hamiltonian. A typical example would be like uh, this uh, graphene. In the graphene, we know we have the direct nodal point. Near direct nodal point, we have this isotropic spectrum. Although the whole band only have a 60 degree rotation symmetry, but actually near the nodal point, we have a continuous rotation symmetry. So that would be the example that uh, at the low energy, we have more symmetry. And even more, uh, this uh, direct point actually have an emergent Lorentz symmetry. You know, not only just a continuous rotation symmetry, have Lorentz symmetry. And also, we have a two direct point. Then the at the low energy, the electron number conserved independently at these two different direct points. Then we have the, the original U1 symmetry became U1 cross U1 symmetry. So there's a lot of emerging symmetry at the low energy. So that is a, so we're hoping using this emerging symmetry to characterize uh, these uh, gapless states. So that's uh, the, the desire. And uh, in, in especially, especially in the recent study of this emerging symmetry, we find that this emergent symmetry can be very general. Like, uh, like this, uh, uh, from 60 degree rotation to continuous rotation, that's uh, one example. But however, this kind of emergent symmetry is still described by group, but just a bigger group. So, so we have emergent symmetry which are described by bigger group. But sometimes emergent symmetry can be so-called anomalous symmetry, you know, some, some more weird symmetry. So I will, maybe I will mention a little bit of what is anomalous symmetry later. And it also can be a so-called higher form of symmetry. Maybe some symmetry not described by a group, but described by another thing called a higher group, some weird mathematical thing. And even that is not enough. There's also so-called algebraic higher symmetry, can be that. I mean, even higher group don't describe them. Something beyond higher group. And this algebraic higher symmetry can also be anomalous. So there's all kinds of weird symmetry which can be emergent. Although the largest symmetry is always, always described by group, but the emerging symmetry can be much more general. And this so-called algebraic higher symmetry have a many different names. It's a new concept, so different people give different names. So it's also called a non-invertible symmetry our fusion category symmetry and, and the things like that. Okay. So we kind of call all this a symmetry called generalized symmetry. Okay. So that is kind of a, a recent uh, development. We, we see more and more symmetry. 
because the general, generalized symmetry is so general, then we start to dream. <laughs> Maybe this general, generalized symmetry is so general, so rich, it can fully characterize the gapless states. So we are thinking about the one-to-one -one correspondence. That is, uh, uh, the each gapless states have its own distinct uh, characteristic emergent general symmetry. Yeah, this is very bold, which may not be true. But I hope at least uh, they largely characterize the gapless states. So once you fix emergent symmetry, maybe there's only a few possible gapless states, I hope. But anyway, uh, uh, I feel that uh, it doesn't hurt to use this uh, uh, idea as a, as a guiding principle to do research. Hopefully, uh, this works. And uh, using this as a starting point uh, to develop a general theory for a gapless uh, state. So that is uh, 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 the motivation for this kind of uh, uh, study. So, uh, but to, to really uh, push this uh, uh, idea forward, and then do one need one need to have a, a, a unified theory for generalized symmetry, because you can see that the symmetry can be described by group, a higher group, they can be anomalous, or maybe even beyond higher group. So it's a mess. However, it turns out that uh, actually there's a, a, a there's a better way to view all those generalized symmetry in a single framework. So in a sense. Uh, so right now, just uh, throw some jargon, I will explain it later. So this generalized symmetry is kind of like a so-called non-invertible gravitational anomaly, which is essentially the same as a topological order in one higher dimension. So the topological order coming back, uh, although it's, uh, it's uh, introduced to describe systematically the gap of the states, but somehow this uh, is happened to be a theory to describe a generalized symmetry then maybe it's a theory also describe gapless states. Certainly there's an issue, you know, how come uh, quantum matter in one higher dimension have anything to do with the gapless states at the lo one lower dimension? How that connection can happen? Well, it's a basic is falling. These uh, simple gapless states can be viewed as a boundary for topological order in one higher dimension. That's how two things connected. So topology describes symmetry and their boundary describe the corresponding gapless states. Okay, so basically this is a thing I try to uh, describe today, yes. So when you say the generalized symmetry, does that include the ordinary symmetry of the special case? Yes. So, so does that imply that even the ordinary symmetry has something to do with topological order in one higher dimension? Yes, yeah. So, uh, so I will uh, give an example for that. that. That's basically the, the example I'm going to give, yeah. So, so, so now I try to try to describe an uh, example to see how how this connection may happen. And uh, the example I gave is really just a very simple this uh, uh, one plus dimensional transverse field icing model. So this uh, x y z is just a continuation notation. It's a it's a poly matrix. So we have this uh, z spin spin coupling nearest neighbor coupling, and we have a magnetic field in x direction. So that's a transverse field uh, icing model. Okay, so this have a symmetry. Uh, the symmetry are generated by this product of a poly spin x or poly x operator, which is flip spin up to spin down. So this spin up to spin down uh, z two symmetry. <coughs> okay. Then with this z two symmetry, the very 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 important concept are so called the local symmetric operator. So those operator like a single x or zz operator, they are invariant under this uh, symmetry. So those are, those are operator respecting symmetry. That means uh, the Hamiltonian are formed by those operator. If you probe in the system without breaking symmetry, then you're only uh, adding this kind of operator to probe the system at the perturbation. Okay, so, so with this uh, operator point of view, we can understand the symmetry in the following way. So first we can take this left-right basis, like a spin on the left or right direction or left direction, in x direction, okay. So then first we think all the spin to the right is my reference state. So all the spin to the right is reference, means nothing. 
Then we have a, a few a flipped spin, the, this left spin. Okay, so that's we view this as a, some kind of excitation. Okay, then we ask what happened to those uh, left spin. And when I say what happened means that we can apply all kind of probe, this kind of uh, symmetric uh, operator uh, allow the perturbation. We can change in those uh, states. When you apply those kind of uh, perturbation, then we find that uh, this, uh, this uh, left spin have a multiple conservation. Their number cannot change arbitrarily. They can only change by two. Uh, because uh, if you do, if you apply x operator to this uh, left or right spin, it don't, doesn't matter. They don't change the spin direction. If you apply this two z operator, these are create uh, two left spin or move one left spin to another place. So therefore, this uh, this uh, this uh, left spin have a motor conservation, and this motor conservation is uh, what we mean by this uh, z two symmetry. That's from conservation law to z two symmetry. Okay, so uh, so actually we can we can say this uh, we can using this one to describe ground states and e to describe a single left spin. Then this motor conservation can be described by this fusion rule. This e and e together can become one, but single e cannot become one. So they're like e e can annihilate, but single e is conserved. There's something like that. So this is, a, this is really the point of view that uh, using, this, uh, using this fusion uh, ring or fusion rule to describe symmetry, that is the point of view we are going to use. Rather than using the symmetry transformation which form a group to describe symmetry. So this is a, a, is a little bit shift point of view. We, 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 we try to look at symmetry not from a group transformation, but from, this, uh, from the selection rule, from the fusion rule uh, point of view. Okay, so, uh, so when you're using this point of view, then you find actually for the transverse field icing model, there's a hidden symmetry, which we call the dual Z2 symmetry. Okay, and this hidden symmetry can be seen by choosing this up and down basis. Okay, rather than left or right basis, we choose up and down basis. In the up and down basis, we can have a domain walls, the region of up and the region of down, and between them, they have a domain wall. Then again, we see that uh, there's a, the domain wall also have a motor conservation. By applying this kind of, uh, this ZZ spin or single X, we can never create a single domain wall, but only, only, always two domain wall. ZZ uh, operator don't do anything because Z uh, it's uh, it's because up and, and down are eigenstate of Z operator. But X can, can flip one spin, which is shift the domain wall, or create a two domain wall. So that's just a, so X operator can, can, can create a two domain wall. So we can call this M as a domain wall, and then this, uh, we have fusion rule M and M to trivial. So this is uh, another independent uh, fusion rule. And that describes another uh, symmetry. So in some sense, we try to say that uh, this, uh, the Ising model actually have a symmetry, Z2 symmetry, and a dual Z2 symmetry. Uh, the dual Z2 symmetry is kind of hidden, but uh, both are, are there. So there's two, uh, two selection of two symmetry. So, so then it's, uh, it's very tempting and maybe convenient to combine these two symmetry, we should view icing model as these two symmetry together. So we combine both the symmetry and the dual symmetry. And this combination we, is very important, so we give it a name called the categorical symmetry. So this is really combination of this both symmetry and the dual symmetry. Okay. Why categorical symmetry is uh, uh, important, uh, useful? It's really the following. When you look at the Z2 symmetry, you can see in the uh, in a strong transverse field limit, and uh, uh, the the the, the uh, okay, then the spin basically point in the x direction. Then the single spin flip cost energy uh, from left to right, uh, from right to left cost energy. So this is kind of a symmetric z two symmetric states. When you lower the magnitude h, 
Then this, uh, this spin flip from left to right cause a lower and lower energy. Eventually, we have a lot of, uh, uh, lot of less spin and they condense. Then, they, they got, they, then you go to this uh, Z2 spontaneous symmetry breaking states. Okay. However, we have a similar story that uh, in the low, for the small magnetic field, low H, we have this uh, up and down ground state. This is uh, up and up plus down is a ground state. Then the domain wall cause energies. And this, uh, so this phase actually corresponds to dual Z2 symmetry symmetric states. It's a symmetric for the dual Z2 symmetry. Then when increasing the H, this domain wall cause less and less energy start to proliferating and they condense, the domain wall condensation gave rise to a spontaneous symmetry breaking of a dual Z2 symmetry. But this uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking of dual Z2 symmetry corresponds to Z2 symmetric states. And vice versa, the Z2 symmetry breaking state corresponds to dual Z2 symmetry symmetric states. But the really interesting thing is that uh, at a critical point, we have both symmetry. And uh, yeah. So, so actually the critical point between two phases is characterized by the presence of both the symmetry and the dual symmetry together, simultaneously. And so, so in that sense, uh, we say, yeah, maybe this, uh, this uh, pres simultaneous presence of symmetry, dual symmetry in a critical point maybe is an important feature of a critical point. We try to emphasize that, and using that, try to see the gapless states as emerging symmetry and etc. So this is, a, a, this is a, a basically a, a why we call this categorical symmetry. Yeah. But however, uh, this story is not that simple. There's also uh, uh, some other twist. Okay. You know, here I'm emphasizing one thing. There's two conservation laws. One is a, a Z2 charge conservation. Another is a domain wall conservation. Both are mode two conservation. Both represent Z2 symmetry. Then at the critical point, we have a two conservation. Looks like uh, the, the, the overall symmetry, the total symmetry, is just Z2 cross Z2. We have two independent conservation laws, Z2 cross Z2. But actually, there's a symmetry have extra features. <laughs> so these extra features say that these two symmetry is not that independent. It's, a, it's a, some twist between the two symmetry. So to really uh, describing this uh, symmetry and dual symmetry together, we also need to capture these uh, actual features. So therefore, the categorical symmetry is not just a combination of two conservation law. It is also capture this actual feature of symmetry. This whole thing together corresponds to this notion of a categorical symmetry. Okay. So what is this actual feature? Okay. Uh, actually, this actual feature is not so hard to understand using in this very simple example. To understand this actual feature of symmetry, we need to go a little bit into the mass. That's why we consider the operator to create a pair of a symmetry charge. Uh, for example, for the first Z2 symmetry, the symmetry charge corresponds to left spin. Okay, this is left spin. And they are created by this ZZ operator. The Z operator flips spin from right to left. A pair of Z operator just create a pair of a left spin operator. So, and we view this uh, ZZ operator as an open string operator. You know, it's just two operators, why we call the open string? Well, there are some other reason. So we just view this open string operator with empty bulk. So we have open string operator, but, uh, uh, but the only boundary is non-trivial, empty bulk. Then a pair of uh, Z2 dual symmetry charge, which is the main wall, a pair of the main wall, are also created by open string operator. And here open string operator have a non empty bulk. It's just a product of X over X operator over some certain segment, which flips in from up to down, creating two domain walls. Okay. So, so therefore we have a two very simple uh, string operator, creating a pair of Z2 charge, a pair of dual Z2 charge. Then we can see this actual feature. This actual feature are really encoded in the fact that uh, these two uh, charge pair operators do not commute. 
if the end of a string have a non-trivial linking, they straddled in this particular fashion. If, if one string operator is inside another string operator, they would commute. But however, if they overlap in this particular way, they do not commute. Because uh, you know, one string operator is a product of x, another string operator is a 2z at the end. Then you can see when struggle this way, this z encounter one of x on the same side, they would under commute because this xz uh, under commute. Yes? Um, sorry, so these are not um, symmetry generators because they create some particles, but they don't commute with particles. Yeah, they don't commute Hamiltonian. So but this is a very, uh, 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 this is also a very, very good point. Let me say that. Actually, we call this, uh, this particular operator, we call this a patch symmetry operator. Means uh, it do transformation on the patch, not globally. And this is enough to see symmetry because Hamiltonian is a sum of local terms. If the local operator commute with a patch operator, as long as it's far away from boundary, then we say this local operator is symmetric. So therefore, this patch operator already specifies symmetry completely, but only for local Hamiltonian. Because we are only doing local Hamiltonian, so therefore enough to consider patch operator. So actually, consider patch symmetry operator is uh, pretty important. And that's, that's a lot to see this symmetry dual symmetry more easily and more on equal footing. But this is a little bit uh, technical. But at, at the moment, I really try to say that uh, uh, we have a symmetry charge and a dual symmetry charge. They are created by two patch, two string, open string operator. And these two open string operators do not commute always. Then that means uh, these two symmetry are somehow entangled. If two symmetry are really independent, they should commute in for any configuration. But now here they don't commute in this configuration. And so, and we call this uh, mutual statistics because uh, we can view this uh, operator order uh, as, uh, you know, this different order in operator, we view this uh, vertical direction as time direction. <laughs> so this different order can be combined, it's almost like a, we're making one of a, a end of a string to go around another end of string. This is like configuration to do mutual statistics. <laughs> So we try to say these two charge have non-trivial mutual statistics. And that is the actual feature. Okay. So uh, as I mentioned that uh, there are some symmetry are called have anomaly. So actually this anomaly refer to this actual feature. Okay. But the however, this actual feature actually is more general than anomaly. Basically, uh, uh, what I say that uh, Anomaly belong to this actual feature, but uh, this, uh, the actual feature described by mutual statistics and self-statistics is more general than anomaly. You know, anomaly just subset of this actual feature. That's what I mean. But however, using this um, statistics and mutual statistics is a much better way to understand this uh, anomaly, a better way to understand this actual feature. Okay, so that is a uh, 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 that is a uh, uh, main point. So this may basically is maybe most uh, uh, kind of theoretical part of this. And, uh, but with this, uh, it's, it's, uh, it makes it easier to believe. Actually, uh, there is a holographic picture for symmetry and dual symmetry. As I mentioned that the symmetry and dual symmetry together, not only they have two selection rules, but also there are some mutual statistics. But in one dimension, we cannot do braiding. We, can, we cannot have mutual statistics. So it's more natural to go to one higher dimension. Then we can describe this uh, selection rule and the mutual statistics more naturally. So this is a motivation for that. We can consider the two plus dimensional Z2 gauge theory, which for condensed matter physicists uh, is a two plus dimensional superconductor with a dynamical gauge field. You know, dynamic electromagnetic field in superconductor actually make a superconductor into a Z2 gauge theory. Okay. And in this kind of uh, uh, quantum matter in two plus one dimension, we have a trivial extension. And we have a half flux, and we call M. And we also have electron. 
which is fermion, we call it F. Then you have a bond state between flux and the electron. You know, flux is a boson. Half flux is a boson, and the electron is fermion. Their bond state should be fermion. Well, there is a mutual statistics between electron and the flux, because when electron go around the half flux, there's a change phase of pi. Because this special mutual statistics, their bond states of a fermion and the boson actually became a boson, not the fermion. So there, this bond states F and M actually is a, is a, is a boson. Okay. And so we have two bosons, either this M or the E. Okay. So actually these two bosons have the MO2 conservation. This E and M have a MO2 conservation. They have this fusion rule. And uh, so, uh, so this, so this, uh, this, uh, uh, so this, uh, this uh, MO2 conservation of E corresponds to Z2 symmetry, and the MO2 conservation of this uh, half flux corresponds to Z2 dual symmetry. See, and they're both fermion, or both, they are both bosons, so they correspond to these two symmetry. And then this uh, mutual statistic between E and M they capture this actual feature. So that is a story. That is a, uh, the motor conservation of E corresponds to the Z2 symmetry, motor conservation of M is a Z2 dual symmetry, and they also naturally capture this mutual, mutual statistics. So this really this, this, uh, led to this, uh, uh, the holographic uh, theory. So this, uh, this uh, D2 gate theory, or this uh, two-dimensional superconductor, is, uh, is a more complete theory, or more complete description of a symmetry and a dual symmetry within the icing model. So that is, uh, 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 that's led to this, uh, uh, this uh, holographic theory for the, for the symmetry. So actually, this example is uh, very general. So we, we kind of uh, say that, uh, so every symmetry is a shadow of a topology order. So, uh, so in general, we have ordinary group symmetry, the symmetry described by group. Then it's a, the, the corresponding topology order in one higher dimension corresponds to the gate theory of same group. And when you have anomalous symmetry described by group, then the higher dimensional topology order is a, this so-called diagram written uh, theory. But there are many more topology order in higher dimension, and those, uh, those additional many more topology order describe this more generalized symmetry. And so we believe that all the symmetry and all the generalized symmetry are described by this topology order in one higher dimension. So the idea is that uh, why topology order in one higher, one higher dimension can really describe symmetry because uh, we know the symmetry really constrain the dynamics of the symmetric system, of the system with that symmetry. The topology order actually constrains dynamics of this boundary. So therefore, the, the symmetric system corresponds to boundary of the corresponding topology order. So this, uh, we have this correspondence. Okay. And uh, so, so this really uh, became a very general uh, point of view of, uh, of uh, symmetry. Sorry, yeah. Uh, so the, the topology, like the Z2 topological order in the superconductor case, doesn't uh, guarantee that there is a gapless eigenstate. Yeah, it doesn't guarantee. So I'm not sure how like this topology. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come, back, come back, come to this point. Yeah, I'll describe that. Okay. So, uh, yeah, this, this this is a slide. So there's a you know. Now we have this uh, holographic picture of a symmetry, so how to make use of it. And uh, so one thing we say that when you have a symmetry, we have a gap states. The gap states may be symmetric states, or maybe spontaneous symmetry breaking states. Or maybe so-called uh, symmetry, symmetry perfect topology of the SPD states, or some other things, okay. But using holographic picture, we can obtain the uh, same results. That is, uh, uh, the claim is that uh, the, all the gap phase in one plus one D system are classified by this uh, uh, condensation of uh, uh, onions in the bulk. You know, in the, in the bulk topology order, we have onions. And some onions condense together. That means those onions which are boson and with trivial mutual statistics, and those onions can condense together. 
And then the maximum set anion, which can condense together, have a very scary mathematical name called the Lagrangian condensable algebra. It just means a, a maximum set anion which can condense together uh, naively. Okay. And then when you identify this maximum set anion which can condense together, and you do condense them, and those condensation would give you a gap the gap boundary. And the classification of a gap the phase became a classification of a Lagrangian condensed algebra, basically the, the largest set anion which can condense together. So therefore, there's a, that's a one application. So therefore, we can classify the gap the phase of matter by say which, an, which set anion can condense together. And in this example of Z2 symmetry, we can see that M and 1 can condense together. And M and E cannot connect uh, because M and E have a non-trivial mutual statistics. They cannot condense together. Okay. If M and 1 condense together, we only get this Z2 symmetric state, which break, spontaneously breaks the Z2 dual symmetry. Also, we have E and 1 can condense together. That's another Lagrangian condensed algebra. And when they condense together, we break the Z2 symmetry, but uh, do not break Z2 dual symmetry. And that is spontaneous symmetry breaking states. So this, this is an example uh, uh, for just, just study which anion can connect together, we can get a uh, phase, gap the phase of matter. And for the Z2 symmetry, we don't have SPT states. If you do the same thing for the Z2 cross Z2 symmetry, the bulk will be Z2 cross Z2 gate theory. Then there's a more possibility of anion condensation, and there you can even get uh, SPT states, which is a new kind of matter which is beyond central breaking. But just consider anion condensation. So, that's the, so therefore, this picture also works uh, for gapped states. And, uh, but however, if you condense the maximum set of anion, you can get a gapped boundary. Then what happens if you do not condense the maximum set? Then if you do not connect the maximum set, you're bound to get a gapless boundary. So that's another claim, is that the, the gapless states for the certain symmetry correspond to this uh, so-called non-Lagrangian or maybe smaller condensable algebra. So this really led to this, uh, this, uh, uh, the beginning of uh, this, uh, this uh, thought that maybe this uh, uh, topology in one higher dimension and the emerging symmetry can somehow classify or systematically understand the gapless phase of matter. So in this example, we tried using this uh, smaller condensed algebra, smaller set of anion, which can condense together to classify or to correspond to this uh, gapless system. For this Z2 symmetry, the smaller set is a trivial anion. So there's a, if a boundary don't have any condensation, this boundary has to be gapless. And this uh, condensation less, or maybe we can call this a one condensed boundary, correspond to critical point. So this uh, e, e condensed is a, is a Z2 uh, symmetric state, oh, M condensed is Z2 symmetric state, E condensed is a Z2 symmetry breaking, and one condensed is a critical point. So this is really uh, led to this uh, uh, more, uh, more general uh, picture for this uh, uh, symmetry and a symmetry. Uh, for gap and the gapless states. And uh, so, uh, so then the, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so can we get more quantitative? So this is just some, some very vague thought, you know, just some correspondence. But can we obtain some more quantitative description? You know, how can a gapless states are determined by the bulk topology order? and there's anion condensation. And so here's some sketch. So first we have to say that uh, what kind of data to describe emerging symmetry? Because here we say that uh, the gapless states are described by emerging symmetry. And uh, here we already say that, uh, actually we try to say that uh, emerging symmetry are always described by topological order in one higher dimension. So this question became what data we should use to describe topology order in one higher dimension, quantitatively. Then if we want to relate a symmetry to gapless states, we also have to answer what kind of data should we use to describe a one plus one dimensional gapless states. And if you have this data, then you should ask 
how these two data get related. If these two data get related, then we, we can say that the bulk topology order determine the gap states. We have we see some relation between them. But actually, the, the data to describe a topology order uh, can, be, uh, can be obtained in the following way. So certainly we say that uh, when the uh, topology order means uh, they have an energy gap and they have a degenerate ground state, say, on the torus. Okay. And uh, then uh, when you have degenerate ground state on the torus, we can construct so-called ST matrix, which is uh, simply say that we have a ground state wave function, this alpha label different degenerate ground states. Then you do the 90 degree rotation, x go to y, y go to minus x, that's a 90 degree rotation. And a complete overlap of two ground state wave function. The, our system don't have a rotation symmetry, so its overlap is tiny. So this overlap is exponentially small, e to the minus area. But however, if you remove this exponential small part, and there's a constant part do not depend on area, this constant part turns out to be universal, uh, do not depend on detail wave function. And this is called the S matrix. Similarly, we can do the shear deformation. X go to X plus Y, Y go to Y. This shear deformation and can overlap. We have similar story. There's an exponential small term. We remove. We're looking for the constant area independent term. That is T matrix. And this S T matrix actually became a very detailed description of a topology order. Almost one to one, but not quite. Okay. So this, uh, we can say this ST matrix is a data to describe a bulk topology order, very quantitatively. Then how do we quantitatively describe gapless states? Well, a very simple idea, we use a partition function. You know, the partition function is a, temp a function of inverse temperature. Well, we can do the, uh, we'll do some twist. <laughs> so, uh, 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 we instead of doing trace of a Hamiltonian, we do trace of a Hamiltonian with some kind of momentum shift, uh, with some momentum operator, uh, translation operator. So this partition function would become a tau. So the imagine of tau corresponds to this uh, inverse temperature times the system size, something like that. And the real part of a tau corresponds to this uh, uh, translation in x direction. So therefore this partition function as a function of tau uh, this function became a quantitative description of a gapless states. So that is, a, uh, that is our quantitative, quantitative description of gapless states. And this quantitative description of gapless states have a very special uh, property. It's called a moduli invariant. And uh, so uh, because this, uh, uh, this modular transformation is what we call this, uh, this, uh, this uh, 90 degree rotation and uh, shear twist, these two transformations a generator group called a modular group. And, uh, and the, under this modular transformation, uh, it turns out the partition function environment under this. So this, uh, this uh, tau, this uh, kind of tau to tau plus one, tau to one over minus one over tau, is corresponding this to 90 degree rotation. Actually, this is 90 degree rotation, and this is a shear twist, these two modular transformation. Okay. So this is a, uh, so this really became a, a, a story for the gapless uh, uh, one plus one D system. But however, for the, but however, for the, for the symmetry, we are not, we are really considered the boundary of a two dimensional topology order. For gapless boundary of two dimensional topology order, we have actual twist. The partition function is not just a number; it's a vector. It has many components because. Uh, because the partition function is just a, a, a boundary, it's a gapless, it's a gap, gapless a, a boundary gave rise to some non-trivial partition function. But we have option to insert the word line of anion in the middle of a cylinder <laughs> in the bulk. Okay. We insert the word line of anion in the bulk. The boundary, like have different boundary condition on the boundary. And have different sector, and different sector have different partition function. So therefore, uh, the boundary of a topology order is a gapless, and it's described by vector-like partition function. Okay, so the partition function is a many component, and the number of components correspond to number of onion type in the bulk. 
Okay. Then the key thing starts uh, with these two data. We can see the relation. Actually, this um, this uh, vector-like partition function, they are not modular invariant. They are modular covariant. Under this uh, modular transformation, they transform using some under some kind of ST matrix, which are representation of a modular group. And this ST matrix happened to be the ST matrix we introduced for the bulk topology order. So this modular covariant boundary partition function and the bulk topology order are related by this, uh, this uh, same uh, ST matrix. So this is, uh, uh, so this is, uh, 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 so this is this really uh, 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 how how the how the bulk topology order de determine the uh, gapless uh, the boundary states. So the uh, so there's a but there's a one issue is that uh, uh, you know we want to determine this function of tau. How can this two algebraic equation determine a function? You know, function have infinite unknown. We need an infinite equation to determine infinite unknown, not the two equation to determine the whole function. Well, there's some possible, there's some chance that may happen. That is, uh, if you write this uh, a function of tau in terms of q, q is a two pi i tau. Actually, this q is really e to the beta e, so describe energy levels. And uh, this, uh, then this tau is basically, this partition function is a polynomial. And the coefficient of the polynomial as a function q is a degeneracy of this particular energy level. There's a degeneracy of many about the state of this particular energy level. So therefore, this uh, polynomial, this uh, z is a polynomial of a q with a coefficient which is a non-negative integer. So a very special function. So because this is a very special function, so there are some chance, I, I believe this is really the case, that uh, this two algebraic equation can determine this whole function of, a, of, a, of a z, in most cases at least. Okay. So this is really a, called a generalized modular bootstrap. You know, the standard modular bootstrap is uh, to finding this uh, modular invariant partition function. And, uh, but the generalized means that it's just a small twist. Uh, we, we just say, yeah, we have a boundary of a topology order, and then the bulk topology order would give rise to this uh, uh, vector, uh, determine the vector-like partition function. Okay. And there's a, uh, there's a study, uh, I think, uh, in string theory or in the conformal theory, is kind of this, uh, it's a called the chiral modular bootstrap. We're assuming this uh, function is only a function of tau, uh, not tau bar. Then determine this, uh, this kind of, uh, 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 this kind of uh, partition function. Here's a little more general. We have a function both tau and tau bar, but we'll try to finding this uh, modular covariant partition function. So this is basically the, the story. That is uh, the, 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 the bulk topology order may determine the boundary partition function in the algebraic sense. Or maybe I, will, 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 I want to say this is all like, like a number theoretical way because uh, we need this polynomial with a non-negative integer coefficient how to input that condition into, into our story, into our calculation. So it's a, that is a, a pretty much a challenge. Okay, okay, so, so actually uh, I think that's, a, that's basically the main thing. And uh, uh, so we can, really, we can really do it. And uh, uh, for, let, me just, let me just flash some, something. For example, if you do this uh, uh, for, the, for the Z2, uh, uh, example, Z2 icing model example, the bulk is a Z2 gauge theory, and we want to find the, the boundary vector like partition function, which transform covariantly. Well, for Z2 gauge theory, there's a four onions in the bulk, so the partition function is the four component. Then is uh, uh, this partition function using this uh, knowledge of conformal character, we can really obtain this kind of uh, uh, multi-component partition function, and. Uh, then we can even do some, maybe then flash some result. Even for the S3 symmetry, we can get a more general thing. And uh, some conformal field theory, we can determine what kind of conformal field theory describing this S3 critical point. And even for the, 
for the S3 symmetry with anomalies, so this is like a, some kind of anomalies, then we have a, some kind of gapless states with anomalies, anomalous S3 symmetry, and with a different anomaly, we can get a different gapless, different conformal theory, so like this S09 level two, and U1 level two conformal field theory, things like that. And uh, further, for even yet a third anomaly, we got this uh, a, a 6.5 minimum model with U1 level two, so, so actually this program can be really uh, carried through and we can get some concrete results. And uh, which demonstrate that the symmetry can largely determine the gapless states. But, using some kind, but not using this uh, uh, RG calculation, but using some kind of number theoretical uh, calculation. Yeah. So, so that is uh, uh, the summary. Uh, so the symmetry actually is not a group theory. Actually, it's better to understand the symmetry as a shadow of a topology order in one higher dimension. And one consequence of that, uh, you know, the same topology order may have a cast different shadow. So that means uh, the symmetry described by different group and different anomaly can be totally equivalent. So you can see a lot of equivalence relation between symmetries, which is uh, some of the relation are kind of surprising. But uh, in this talk, I mainly describe that uh, this emerging symmetry can also, as a, as a systematic way, to understand the gapless states. Hopefully, uh, you know, it's just a very, very, very early stage. Now, hopefully, uh, using this point of view, we can develop a systematic theory for gapless states and uh, uh, for, for critical theory. Yeah, thank you very much. Exactly, is the claim in 2D? So, is the claim that somehow 2D modular bootstrap is equivalent to classification of 2 plus 1 in topological order? And the second question is, if you think that this program goes up to higher dimensions, then um, what's the what's the one bigger dimension analog of conformal bootstrap? Yeah. So the uh, uh, okay. Yeah. So so the, here I didn't describe the full story. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let me go go back to this. Uh, yeah. So, uh, like this relation, and uh, uh, so actually solving this, you get many solutions, not just one solution, you know. Although you get discrete set solution, that's already a big advantage. And uh, so, so therefore, because you can, so this is just one of the solution of this equation, but there are there indeed other solutions. So then that means uh, this program fails. The topological order in one higher dimension do not determine the, the gapless state uniquely. However, there's a, a, it's not that bad in a certain sense. There's other solution with a higher central charge with a more low energy degree freedom. And those other solutions actually have a more emerging symmetry. Because uh, this is just one solution with this kind of emerging symmetry, the Z2 topological order in one higher dimension. And there's some other solution also have these two topology in one higher dimension as the emerging symmetry. But other solution may have additional emerging symmetry. So therefore, there's many solutions, but the other solution may have even more emerging symmetry, which you did not assume at the beginning. So therefore, uh, so therefore when you have a gapless states, you should describe all the possible emerging symmetry. In a more modern uh, language, that you should find all the topological default line. <laughs> and uh, then we say that so when you find all the emerging symmetry, and then this maximum emerging symmetry or maximum categorical symmetry determine this uh, one higher dimension topological order, and that one may have a one to one correspondence. And uh, from this point of view, when you fix the symmetry, then you should find the solution with a minimal, I don't know, yeah, this is still open question, maybe minimal central charge. And that may have a, who, which do, ha, do not have additional emergent symmetry. And actually this one, this solution indeed is a solution with a minimal central charge. So in that sense, it may determine this, uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, gapless states. And for the, uh, for the relation to the uh, uh, bootstrap, it's really the following. Uh, 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 let me see where it is, yeah. Uh, my understanding is that the conformal bootstrap indeed use this relation. I use more than that. 
But however, uh, my understanding is that uh, they use a condition that this, co this coefficient is non-negative. They are not using condition of this coefficient is a non-negative integer. And a non-negative integer is a much stronger condition. And uh, actually, I don't know how to really use that condition, non-negative integer. And there, there's some, well, I need some theoretical advance to, to in, impose this uh, non-negative integer condition. And uh, for higher dimension, I really don't know. But on the other hand, uh, I kind of present this story so that uh, the same thing can apply to higher dimension. But actually, what the higher dimension really the same story I really, I need really to do concrete calculation to see whether it's similar stuff. But there's a, I described the one plus one story in such a way that a generalization to higher dimension is direct, is straightforward. But one really need to check some example to see the story actually holds. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting research direction to really, because in higher dimension we don't have a, we don't know how to compute anything. So I need to, maybe there are some simple thing one can indeed compute and to check whether this idea actually work or not. Although this idea can be generalized directly, it may fail at higher dimension. Maybe it's accidentally one plus one dimension. So I cannot rule that out. Yeah. So that's the situation. Yeah. Yeah, this is also a very good uh, question. Uh, you know, in general, when you have gapless states, and uh, uh, it, it may not have linear dispersion relation, so it, have, it may have other quadratic dispersion relations, something, and so et cetera. And uh, here I do make an assumption that, uh, you know, the, the gapless state with a quadratic dispersion also exists, but they are kind of uh, not that stable. So when you add up some arbitrary perturbation, it may become linear. So, because as a first stage of the calculation, we, we kind of ignore that, so that one with a quadratic expression, we just concentrate on linear dispersion relation. But even with the linear dispersion relation, there's trouble. Because in general, the gap state may have different velocity. It's not Lorentz invariant. And, uh, this, but however, there's also something, idea that uh, the sector with different velocity can decouple at the low energy. If they couple strongly at the low energy, they may renormalize velocity to be the unique velocity. Although this is not totally firm, but uh, again, as a first step, let's ignore that possibility. Let me just say, let's consider one sector with same velocity. And then with this understanding, then we can cast into this, uh, 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 this, uh, this modular covariant thing. It's really dependent on that. So there's, indeed, there's a gap. Yeah, the, but I really hope uh, this, this condition can be generalized to the situation with different uh, linear velocity. And this is a little difficult because this is really space-time picture. So then with different velocity, this space and time have different relations. How to put them together is a, is a challenge. Uh, so actually, I don't know. But on the other hand, if you turn things around to say, maybe this means that uh, the sector with different velocity always decouple at a critical point. So that became a, a proposal, whether one can show that. If they always decouple the low energy, then can study sector by sector. Yeah, so this is, a, yeah, that's, there's a gap here, indeed. I didn't understand why you threw out quadratic bandwidth. Those can be protected by symmetry. Yeah, and uh, uh, yes, sometimes, sometimes a quadratic uh, dispersion relation is a, is a, is a, uh, can be a stable critical point. And uh, so I can only say that uh, the story I present here don't work there. And, uh, but then the question whether, how one should modify this story? Can we find a way? So that's yet another question. You know, for linear dispersion, it looks like there is a systematic picture. Can one generalize this picture further to include the stable quadratic case? And uh, I don't know, that seems that, uh, uh, let me put this way, okay. One thing really missing here is that uh, uh, this, uh, this symmetry I talk about here is uh, always an uh, internal symmetry. I don't know how to include the space-time symmetry like translation, rotation. And that may be important because for quadratic theory, you have different conformal symmetry. And uh, so that's a, a big, big open issue. A, a very urgent one, actually. How to combine the space-time symmetry with internal symmetry and the view 
this this topology order in one higher dimension actually should be the should capture this combination of space time symmetry and internal symmetry. And then I almost want to say the answer is ADF CFT. <laughs> so there's some combination of ADF CFT and the story talk here. In ADF CFT, this uh, seems to have a space time symmetry in it. And uh, so, but I don't know how to, how these two pictures should be combined together. But that's a, that is a thing. Then with the ADF CFT, then this, uh, this quadratic uh, critic point, this, uh, the, the, the bulk uh, metric uh, would be different. Yeah. But again, this is, uh, yeah, this is a, uh, some op open direction, yeah. So just want to understand a, a simple example in higher dimension. So say if I have a massless Dirac fermion yeah. versus a massive Dirac fermion, in this point of view, it will say there is some kind of categorical symmetry yes. that protects this kind yeah. of So the, here, uh, yeah, here the, 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 the gas is falling uh, in, in the, uh, in three plus one dimension, there's a Z2 gauge theory where charge is a fermion. And that one uh, may protect the boundary state, maybe with one Marana fermion. So the single mapless Marana fermion may correspond to the condensationless boundary of a dot. And in that model, the charge is fermion cannot condense, but the gauge flux loop can condense. The condensation of gauge flux loop occurs on the giving rise Marana fermion a master. So there are two phases. The flux loop condensation boundary is a gapped Marana fermion. And if the flux loop do not condense, we get a gapless Marana fermion. So there's a, a, again, this is a guess, you know. Uh, at the moment, it seems natural, but one need a more con calculation to see whether this is really hard or not, yeah. Maybe I can take the yeah. benefit of being the, the person. What motivated you to do this? Is it more from a com computational point of view, or, or you know you can calculate, or you actually can have a broader picture than having implications in other places we can look for new phenomena? Yeah, uh, I think the the the. Uh, the main motivation really uh, 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 is uh, from this uh, understanding point of view. We want to have a general understanding. You know, it means uh, not a case-by-case -case understanding, but a general framework. It's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, after the quantum Hall states, and uh, so we start to developing a kind of general understanding of, the, of this many border entanglement. And uh, to try to understand what is the mathematics behind this many body entanglement and uh, try to classify all the possible quantum Hall states. And I hope we can achieve a similar thing for a gapless state. The quantum Hall state is a gapped state, which is much easier. The gapless state is, is, was thought to be impossible. We have uh, just no clue where to start. But with emerging symmetry, especially with a generalized emerging symmetry, suddenly we feel we may have a chance to, to break this case from this point of view. But however, the, the, uh, the practical motivation is that uh, it's a high superconductor. There's a lot of slave particle theory, uh, which, uh, uh, which at low energy, we thought, okay, maybe there's some QED3, QCD3, with a gauge coupling go to infinity, we normalize to finite, it's really a mess. And then, uh, then with this, uh, with this more general understanding, uh, we wish we can understand the emerging symmetry for those kind of uh, slay particle theory. And from a symmetry point of view, to pin down what is the low energy uh, state, what is the low energy behavior. Right now, we are not there yet, but uh, I hope this, uh, this kind of development would emphasize, will, will will guide us to emphasize the symmetry. We try to identify the emerging symmetry. Once we identify all the emerging symmetry, maybe we have a chance to pin down what is the possible low energy states. And then from there to, to obtain some kind of low energy property non-perturbatively. So, uh, so, so there's a, actually this is the uh, uh, application, I hope. Another application would be the critical point. Uh, for example, it's a very simple critical point. It's a kind of one-dimensional uh, model with S3 symmetry. And uh, then there's a, there's a symmetry breaking state from S3 symmetry to completely symmetry breaking state, uh, SZ1 symmetry. 
what is the critical point of this complete S3 symmetry breaking? Critical point. I thought this well known, the S3 symmetry post model, we studied so many uh, times, so many papers on that. But actually, post model only describe S3 symmetry to Z2 symmetry transition. I find, I, I, actually, I, I do some search. I didn't find any result on S3 to Z1 symmetry, this complete symmetry breaking transition. It's maybe still open question that whether this S3 symmetry to Z1 symmetry, this continuous transition exists or not. Uh, if it exists, what kind of CFT describing that? So, so, and, uh, so, so this will be another application. So in a sense, if I go take a simpler analogy, what you're searching for is some sort of phase transition theory similar to what in, uh, has been developed in symmetry breaking systems. Yes. Then you, none of the details matters. That's right. The details don't matter. This is, yeah, yeah, here we emphasize on this universal property. You know, before we compute those universal property, sometimes using epsilon expansion by shifting dimension or large expansion. And here we try to say maybe there's a number of theoretical way to compute this, uh, 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 this universal uh, properties. Yeah. Uh, that's Bob, yeah. Uh, I want to repeat a question from behind me about specific examples in higher dimension, starting with the bulk of 3 plus 1. And what I think I heard is that you have no idea. Did I hear that correctly? You don't have any example. Exactly. Exactly. So you're sort of hoping that you're going up. That's right. You're going to get them. Now, um, OK. So I'm your grant monitor. <laughs> And I'm, yeah, why do what class? I'm going <laughs> to give you some money. <laughs> and you're going to promise me to have an answer to this by, by X time. What is X? Uh, maybe 10 years? Or maybe 5 years if I'm optimistic. Okay, that's fair. I mean, this is the kind of question. I, what is the yeah. meaning of life? 42? <laughs> that, that's a, uh, that's the reason is a falling. And, uh, that's a solved problem. <laughs> so uh, let, let me describe this. For this, uh, uh, like for this kind of paper, you know, people uh, in conformal physics are doing this so called chiral conformal bootstrap, modular bootstrap. Uh, they, 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 uh, they are now using conformal field theory, just uh, directly solving this equation and uh, using all these conditions. Um, I don't know, they can do this uh, uh, two component, three component, uh, something like that. And uh, I'm hoping whether one can do this uh, for, for general n component, like a five component, six component, 10 component. It's, it's uh, very hard, but, uh, but once you have this uh, very clear direction, Maybe it uh, helps, and uh, I want to use some some techniques. Really, really, this is really a number theory question. This is a polynomial with non-negative coefficient. Satisfying this equation is a very concrete mathematical question, and uh, we'll try to do this in one plus one dimension. Here we are more confident. That they are, they are, this, this this question is well defined and have solutions. We hope this question will define a higher dimension, have a solution, but that is one we don't know. Actually, we, we, we are dying to get some concrete example yeah, to say, yeah, this is really OK. Things may completely fail in higher dimension. So, and, uh, but, uh, but if you believe in the structure, believe that if I'm optimistic, I hope the whole thing can shift to higher dimension, it still works. But this, at the moment, it's just a wish. This is a good segue. It's a good segue to the cheese and wine segue. <laughs> Talk about that segue. Yeah. You're saying that in a three 